Okay, here I am again. So for those of you who don't know, my name is Jelena Gledic, and I work at the Faculty of Philology University of Belgrade at the Chinese Language Department. So China has been mentioned quite a few times today, and I will not get into that topic today. I'm here to talk about something else, and that is a study we did as part of the Refless project. So before I begin, I'd just like to once again thank all the colleagues who worked on this activity. This is one of the, well, I think one of the, the biggest uh, endeavors we took as part of this project, and we've worked on it for a long time, and finally we have the results in this book, which I'm quite proud of, <laughs> and I'm proud of our team, and I'd like especially to thank uh, two persons who helped a lot with doing the majority of the uh, analysis, which is our colleague from the University of Novi Sad, Professor Zoran Aluzhanin, and Vesna Bucha from the National Employment Service. The two of them really helped a lot sum up all these results. So uh, I will talk a bit about these results in the context of the topic of the employability of language professionals. And when we talk about this, a few questions arise. And I will try to be brief, and I will try to answer these questions. So the, these are uh, some things that, that come to mind when you think about what is the employability of language professionals. The first question is, who are they? Who do we consider language professionals? Where do they seek employment? What type of employment is offered to them? How are they assessed in job interviews, which is a very important thing? How easily can they seek jobs outside their primary professional field, which means a combination of languages and some other field? And then, of course, the crucial question, which is a, a question of uh, the strategy of language education, should university studies be aimed towards employability? So the first question, who are these language professionals we talk about? Uh, usually, we think that they are both these things. We think they are both people who have a degree in languages and people who work in translation, interpreting, teaching foreign languages, etc. But they don't necessarily have to be both. And we've heard that several times today, so they can be one or the either. You have a lot of people who have a degree in languages but work in a completely different field. And then you also have people who, who come from a different field. They have a different educational background, but they have managed to specialize themselves in languages as well. So you have a lot of interpreters who are basically some people who are educated as either, I don't know, economists or lawyers or completely different uh, fields. So it's, uh, when talking about the employability of language professionals, this is something that we need to consider. Do we look at them as equal? How do we uh, say uh, uh, what the, the real quality of, of the way they do their work should be? in terms of, of their skills, which are, of course, very different uh, if they are only one of the two, one of the two uh, groups. So uh, the Refless project tried to answer this question in a way, uh, in a way we could, which is by assessing the, those who have a degree in languages. And we made a thorough survey of uh, the labor market, uh, and we uh, surveyed students, current students of language programs in Serbia, in all the universities where you have language programs. We surveyed unemployed graduate philologists, employed graduate philologists companies, uh, and university teachers, and we had a total of 1,826 respondents. So hopefully these, these answers are, are indicative of, of the real state in Serbia today. Uh, so the two questions which uh, when Yasmina and I talked about the results found very important were, are these people satisfied? Are they satisfied with their choice? Are they happy with, with what they studied? And what our results show is that they mostly are. A grand majority is very satisfied with their choice. And what was very surprising to us, a grand majority of those who are unemployed are also very satisfied with their choice, which means they, they still uh, want to find a, a job in their field. And that is another question that we ask, how important is, it is for them to work in the field of languages, and a majority said that it is very important to them, that it is very important to them. And then another question is, why did they choose philology? Why did these 19-year-olds out of high school decide to, to enroll into a language program? And what they said was mostly an interest for foreign languages. So their primary interest is languages, and then you also have culture and literature and other things as well. But what they are interested in is language. So it is very important to uh, honor their wishes in a way and really take care of the study of languages. And those of us who are language professionals really should get involved in ma maintaining a certain standard in our profession. This is uh, a display of some results I thought you might find interesting. Uh, and they concern the uh, persons who graduated from language degree programs in Serbia. So we have a comparison with, between those who are unemployed and those who are employed. 
Uh, and we can see that these two groups are quite similar. So when I say unemployed and employed, unemployed are those who are on the National Employment Service uh, list of unemployed persons. So th they are those who are actively seeking employment. While the employed graduates are, uh, this is the employed graduate sample, all the others are, but the employed graduate sample is not representative because there are not enough bases that can allow us to, to draw a representative sample, but we had a sample of nearly 200 respondents in this field, also across Serbia. And we can see that the two pop populations are quite, quite similar. There are differences, of course, the employed ones are a bit more successful in terms of their average number of years of study and their grade average. Uh, and more of them has, have studied abroad and have additional qualifications. But still, these two populations are quite similar. And it is interesting to note that the grade average of the students is also close to that of the employed graduates. It's, I think, 8.5 seven, if I'm not mistaken, but you have all the, all the results in this uh, publication. Uh, so that, that's what the, what the population basically looks like. And then uh, another question we need to ask is where do they seek employment? And usually when you think about it, you say that they work in schools, be it uh, elementary or high schools, and they work also in language schools. Uh, we've heard today from, from Ms. Fila that in schools you have English, French, Russian, German, Spanish, Italian, Chinese, and she also added Greek. I didn't know Greek was also taught in schools now. So we can see it's, it's a small number of languages. And in language schools also, you have some of them offering some more exotic, to say, languages such as Turkish, which is now becoming more popular, and Japanese and such. But that's not enough if you know that you have tens of students being enrolled in those language programs. So they, they will definitely not all be able to work in schools. So that's why in this, in this survey, we wanted to focus on companies, and that's why we wanted to focus on enterprises, especially small and medium enterprises, which are the majority of, of our sample. And uh, institutions also uh, include uh, government embassies, government bodies, basically ministries. There are a lot of philologists working in ministries and other government bodies, uh, embassies, libraries, cultural centers, etc. Uh, so these are basically the places where they, where they seek employment. So in that sense, it's very uh, indicative to see what, what these employers have to say about them. <laughs> do they need any additional skills? And what they do say is very similar to what, what Mike said. Uh, they usually say that both the, the graduate philologists and the employers say that they did have to get additional uh, uh, training after graduation. And what is also a, a big flag for the universities is that the percentage of them having additional qualifications, a majority of them actually have additional qualification in languages. So a lot of them uh, went out and got certificates, international certificates for their language skills, and some of them even in the languages they majored in. So they wanted to see, they found, which we will see later where we, where we uh, look at how they are assessed when applying for a job, they find that their university degree is not enough and they need to get an international certificate, which is, which is very disconcerting. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, another question is, I'm all in questions <laughs> today, another question is how fast they find a job after graduation. And this was also quite surprising for us because the majority of them find a job within the first year of graduating. Those who are unemployed said that it's a year. Those who are employed said that it's about six months after graduating. They were already employed. But then we come to the second part of the topic today of the title. So we have language prof professionals and we have employability. What does it mean to be employed? Uh, it's a very relative term. So what type of employment is offered? A vast, vast majority of them had, have had only the experience of working temporary or part-time. And you know the, the Serbian system. So to get a contract on neodrđeno vreme, which means indefinitely, is very hard. And a very small percentage of them have ever even had the experience to sign that type of contract. So a lot of them just have worked temporary and part-time. So in that sense, the fact that they did find a job so fast after graduation is OK on one hand. But then on the other hand, if you look at what kind of job it was, it's not that, it's not that good. And uh, the types of jobs available in the companies that we surveyed are mostly uh, language related. And in that, that sense, we have translation, interpreting, and formal correspondence. And those are three areas which are the most needed as assessed by employers. And then also in a smaller percentage, you have companies that offer jobs which uh, require a specialization in language and culture, and then language literature and culture also, but in a much, much smaller degree. Uh, just to add here, 
another interesting result uh, when it comes to the language, literature, and culture. We found a very uh, a big difference between uh, how many uh, students and graduates of philology would like to work in for example, the field of literary translation and how many jobs there actually are in the market. So that's a, that's a, there's a large discrepancy between those two, those two numbers. Uh, and then we come to the question, okay, so they, they graduate, they're satisfied and uh, they find this job within the first six months and then how do they, how do they uh, go through the job interview process? And this was, uh, for me, the most fun part of the survey. So, what, it, it, fun in a bad way. So what the companies do is they usually do not look at papers at all. So they, they don't value the university degree as highly as other things, such as, for one, an interview, their personal interview with the candidate, uh, two, an international certificate, and three, a recommendation. And this would all be fine if there was not the fact that part of this survey was also a set of questions which tried to use the common European framework of reference for languages and to have the employers assess the knowledge of the average job candidate in comparison to their average needs, their average business needs. And a, a lot of employers told us during the, the survey that they are not able to assess those skills based on the common European framework of reference for languages. And a lot of you probably know what this framework looks like. It, it's a lot of statements of what a person can do. So the employers stated that they cannot assess this. The same employers who rely on their interviews to assess the candidates when giving them a job. So that's, that's a very big paradox and, and something that should definitely be looked at. That's one thing. Second thing, international certificate. We can say that this is, this is expected in a way. International certification is something that is, of course, valued in, in every environment. But then the recommendation, an equal number of employers said that they would accept a recommendation from a former employer, as many as would accept a recommendation from a friend or a colleague. Uh, for, of course, of themselves. So that's, uh, Mike mentioned connections in China or Guanxi, which we know are very important. In Serbia, unfortunately, I guess it's the same. So a recommendation of a former employer is equal to a recommendation of a friend. And then uh, regarding the fact, uh, also Mike, I'm mentioning you a lot, <laughs> what you talked, said about communication, uh, these are some of the answers of the employers, what they said, how they assess the, the candidate. They say, we have a talk with the candidate. Papers don't matter, it matters that the candidate can really speak in a foreign language when needed, and the candidate should really know the language. Something that I think should be looked into is what it means to really know a language. What do, they, what do they mean by this? What does it mean that he can really speak? What does it mean that they have a talk with the candidate? Is it uh, uh, an adequate form of assessment? Uh, and also, is that the only important thing? Because this means that language is basically speaking. They don't even look at all the other skills. So we can just throw away the other part of the CFR. Uh, so that's the, way, that's the way employers perceive language skills, that you can speak it when needed. <clears throat> and something I've already said, which is related to the question how easily they can seek a job outside their primary professional field, uh, all the target groups said that they believe that uh, if you look at the current state of language studies and language-based area studies in Serbia, uh, the st students should get additional skills and knowledge during their uh, undergraduate degree program because the fact that they have to go through additional training afterwards, either based on their own initiative or when employed through the company, it really demands a lot of resources, either from the student or philologist himself or from the company. And of course, this raises a very important issue of how that should all be organized because basically the companies are taking a part of the education. If the companies offer training, they are also, they are also, educating, our, they are also educating our philologists. So that's a very important uh, question. And so what should we, as the majority of us representatives of universities do, uh, should we? Should we uh, uh, aim our university studies more towards the employability of students? And to avoid giving a personal answer, I gave you here a pie chart of the answers of our university teachers from Serbia. So this is what they say. They say that university studies should be quite a lot and a lot aimed towards employability. Only a small number of them thinks that they should not. So that's, I think, a big question for 
the third year of our Reefless project. And thank you very much. <laughs>